Good morning, and welcome to this panel discussion on Franklinton, the changing narrative. I'm Tricia Strahler with Spark of Fire Communications, and I'll be facilitating this conversation this morning that's taking place in conjunction with the site visit by the Intelligent Communities Forum. Um, for the third year in a row, Columbus has been named as one of the most seven intelligent communities in the world. And with us today is Mr. Lou Zaccarella, one of the three co-founders of the ICF, who is here <coughs> to tour the city and to present the mayor with our award and also to learn more about the people, the places, and the programs that make Columbus and Central Ohio an intelligent community. Welcome, Lou. Thank you so much, Trish. Great to be here. Thank you. And congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Today we're here at COSI, which does sit at the easternmost entryway to Franklinton, to discuss this transformational community from a number of key perspectives. This uh, City of Franklinton, Settlement of Franklinton, has been a key part of Columbus history since its founding in 1795, and we believe it's on a precipice of a renaissance that we're all very, very excited to share with you and the world. Um, most of the work is taking place from grassroots initiatives, which is very key because that means it'll be sustainable and, and long running. We'll be looking at the storied history of the neighborhood from many perspectives, including its history from the from its foundings in the early 1800s up to mid-century, and then what's going on in the neighborhood now in terms of economic development as well as neighborhood revitalization. There are many stakeholders who have played a role in Franklinton, and I will leave more out than I will mention, but in, you know, in truth, it's been thanks to the efforts of the mayor's office, Mayor Coleman, the city of Columbus, the Franklinton Development Association, the Columbus Idea Foundry, 400 West Rich, and many, many others that are, are working to revitalize this proud neighborhood into a legacy project that's worthy of its historical founding. With us today to discuss this topic are our Columbus City edi Auditor. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a reporter, so editor rolls <laughs> off my tongue better than auditor. Mr. Hugh Dorian, who many people credit with helping put the policies and the practices in place that have allowed Columbus to maintain its AAA credit rating even through some very challenging economic times. But Mr. Dorian's role today is to give us some insight into the history and the heart of Franklinton. Not only is he a self-proclaimed Columbus historian, but he also was raised in Franklinton and so has many unique insights into the neighborhood. Also joining us is Mr. Jim Sweeney, who is the executive director of the Franklinton Development Association. And for more than a decade, Jim and his team have been working towards the redevelopment and revitalization of Franklinton, encompassing everything from economic development to community housing that allows for revitalization without gentrification. We're also very fortunate to have with us today Dr. Caroline uh, Wagner, who is director of the Battelle Center of Science and Technology at The Ohio State University. The mission of her organization is to innovate and find ways to drive economic development at all levels of society. She is particularly interested in social entrepreneurship and its role in Franklinton. Next to her is Dr. Denise Bedford, Goodyear Professor of Knowledge Management at Kent State University. She's one of the key architects of a growing movement called the Knowledge Index for cities, and she believes that there are many lessons in Franklinton that will have global application as the Knowledge Index rolls out worldwide. So, welcome to everyone. Our format today, each of the subject matters are going to take just a little bit of time to discuss Franklinton from their unique perspective. And at the end, that should allow five or 10 minutes at the very end, maybe even 15, for Lou to ask questions and follow up on, on topics that pique your interest. Does that sound like a plan? It's a deal. Okay, so my role in this, other than panel facilitator, is I've been working with Director Cavan and his team since 2011 on assembling, writing, and helping counsel the team on the city's efforts to be named 
two and to stay on the intelligent communities list. And I just want to let you know that I'm very familiar with all the indicators of the ICF and I want to assure you that you are sitting in the heart of the most intelligent community in the world. <laughs> Well, who am I to dispute you today? <laughs> okay, great. Shall we start with Mr. Dorian? Can you just share with us some of the historical context of Franklinton and some of your personal stories about uh, the area? Well, thank you, uh, Tricia, and uh, thanks for hosting this conversation. I, uh, I'm always uh, happy to participate in any discussions about the early stages of Columbus. One of the characteristics of Columbus uh, that I think is so wonderful and, and, and so positive is, is what I consider its inclusiveness and um, uh, the virtue of tolerance and acceptance. And so much of that, in my view, had its beginnings here in Franklinton. And I'll cite a few examples by what I mean. Uh, of course, long before the, the, I'll say, the white settlers came here, you mentioned 1795, I think they, they may have been a first attempt in 1797 was, was when the uh, uh, settlement really got its roots. But before uh, many of our uh, forebears uh, came here, uh, we had numerous uh, Native Americans who were in the area. The, some examples were the, the, the fact that there were at least four tribes uh, very much involved here, uh, again, started uh, indicating that tolerance and acceptance of each other and acceptance of cultures, the Shawnees and the Senecas and the Wyandots and the Delawares. If we just go a few blocks to our west here, you would see a commemorative stone where they came together and, and uh, agreed on peace in the area. That was about 1812 or 1813, and, and I think that's an example that a lot of the world could emulate today. Um, the, um, um, as far as the settlers that uh, came into Franklinton, uh, that idea started with a fellow named George Washington. Um, he uh, commissioned a young surveyor uh, by the name of Lucas Sullivan uh, to come here into the wilderness and uh, start a settlement in this territory. Uh, Sullivan found it very, very difficult to uh, uh, keep folks with him in the area, new settlers, because uh, I think uh, true to any, uh, any newness, uh, there were a lot of anxieties, a lot of fears, and it was difficult to uh, entice uh, some settlers to stay here. Uh, one of the ways that um, Sullivan uh, succeeded was that he, uh, he, it wasn't his land to give, by the way, but he gave them plots of land. And uh, just a block or two from here, you'll find Gift Street. And that is the area in which uh, Sullivan gave plots of land to, uh, to keep folks here. Uh, again, mentioning that idea of acceptance and, and uh, tolerance of each other, uh, we think so much of uh, settlers in that area uh, being white, white settlers, uh, a bit of, um, I think, a beautiful virtue of the beginnings of this uh, settlement of Franklinton. Uh, we also had, of course, today we would say an American, uh, African American child and his parent. Uh, obviously, in the literature, it re referred to the child as a black child. Um, his name was Arthur Boak. Uh, was raised by the Lucas Sullivan family. Um, young Arthur Boak was uh, researched and identified by a, a wonderful uh, uh, historian here in Franklinton today by the name of uh, B. Murphy. Uh, that young man is uh, buried in the Lucas Sullivan family plot today down in uh, Green Lawn Cemetery. Uh, and I think these, this, this growing tolerance and acceptance, I think, is a beautiful virtue that, that uh, continued into our current culture here in, in the Columbus area. The uh, uh, Sullivan family was so prominent, uh, this area, um, some folks considered it a derogatory comment, but it's not. It's referred to as the bottoms. It was always referred to as the bottoms when I was much, much younger. Uh, that's because it is the lowest topography in central Ohio. Um, the uh, bottoms is even used that term in some of the early literature describing. Well, because of its low topography, it has a long history of floods. 
Um, I'm sure some of us came across the fourth, uh, the Broad Street Bridge. Well, that's the fourth Broad Street Bridge that has existed in our time. Um, Lucas Sullivan allegedly uh, built a, um, a toll bridge across the river uh, to go from the bottoms to what was considered the high banks or the higher area. It's no coincidence that the main uh, thoroughfare on the other side of the river is called High Street. And uh, many folks, uh, some of the literature says that uh, Lucas Sullivan charged a toll for everyone crossing that bridge, except on Sundays, because he wanted everybody to get to church free. Uh, but, but that's another example of, of an entrepreneurship. Also, Sullivan and some of his colleagues uh, accumulated the uh, land on the um, uh, east side of the river, the east side of High Street. And um, um, that's where your state capitol building stands today, about 10 acres of land that was uh, sold and partially contributed by Sullivan and his colleagues. Um, I mentioned that it's, the area has been subject to flooding, uh, sometimes quite frequently in those early days. Um, in 1913, there was a very, very terrible flood here in the community. Uh, the old house that I grew up in, I wasn't there in 1913, uh, but uh, had a watermark on the second floor. The old red brick house, the water had to be 12, 13 feet deep at that time. One of the prominent families here in Columbus, uh, back in those days we had, uh, believe it or not, interurban railway, and they loaded up their personal boats out in Buckeye Lake and shipped them here into the bottoms to help evacuate people. Uh, there was a lot of uh, loss of life. That was a very, very terrible flood. Um, that flood uh, then caused uh, folks to say, we've got to do something about this river. Uh, so that's uh, a very few years after that, some of the flood walls, the early flood walls were created. A bit of irony is that today we're narrowing the river back to some would say its original width and I kind of question that but it will be considerably uh, less wide than it is today. All of that development area, all that land um, that is now filled in and will be, it will be public parks, public parks and open uh, green space. I'm a, I'm a champion of open space and green space especially in downtown areas. Um, so you'll be seeing that development. Um, it's going on right now, but will be concluded in another year or so. Um, after 1913, uh, the, the folks here experienced, let's say, a good streak. Uh, but in 1959, uh, which I and my family were flooded out of, of the bottoms in January of 1959, and um, that was not as severe as the 1913 flood. But that then caused a, 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 a greater fervor for more flood controls. And then the flood wall, which Jim can talk about with uh, more uh, expertise, but that's what spurred the development of the flood wall as we know it today. During that period of time, especially from the 50s up until the flood wall, I think started the early 90s, it was completed around the early 2000s, about a 10 year stretch. Well, you couldn't get a building permit here in Franklinton. You're in the floodplain. And, and you had population losses, you had commercial losses. Uh, and then, of course, and Jim will talk about the development of 315, which came along in the 60s. I've often argued that when you look at Columbus and you think of inner belts or highways, we paid a terribly high price for these inner belts, not simply in monetary measurements, but in cultural measurements. It separated so many of us. It, it, today we talk about East Franklinton and West Franklinton. That's because of Route 315 separated us. And Jim will talk about the terrible, terrible decline in uh, uh, population uh, as a, partially as a result of that, that uh, area being divided. So Franklinton uh, uh, was home to me for many, many years. I especially cherish the inclusiveness. Um, I mentioned that much of the popula early population of Franklinton was uh, Appalachian. Uh, my own parents uh, were both immigrants uh, from Ireland and Scotland, and found their way to Columbus, Ohio. But there was an acceptance here for all cultures and all nationalities. 
Uh, you had the major churches here. Lucas Sullivan started the first early cemetery, which is just a few, few blocks from here. You could walk to it for that matter. So there's so much history over here. And, and I've been so blessed because my office is on the first floor of the west side of City Hall. And I can look out my window and see all this current development going on. And sometimes I say, hurry up. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I have a lot of fond memories. And as I said, um, when we think of all the developments of the city of Columbus, and if we just go back uh, three or four censuses ago, um, the population in Columbus has grown 40% in the last four censuses. It's the only city in Ohio that has grown. For many years, I used to brag about uh, Columbus, Ohio uh, uh, for its, its government structure and its education structure. How many colleges and universities we have within a 25 or 40 mile radius of here. And of course, our premier, I brag about all the time, Ohio State University. And I love to brag about COSI. And I love to brag about the uh, Franklin Park Conservatory and so forth. But more and more over the last couple of decades, I also like to brag about the growth of medical science here in central Ohio. Very, very much growth in a, poor, a premier area in, in medical science today. So some of, these are some of my thoughts. I'm obviously, I think you can tell, very, very proud of this community. But when you set all the bricks and mortar aside and you set all the physical development aside, the most cherished thing to me in this community is its, its tolerance, its virtue of acceptance, uh, respect uh, for all of our different cultures. And I would hope and pray that would always continue. I'm going to quit for a while now. Thank you, Mr. Dorian. That, was, but, uh, that was a wonderful synopsis of what it was like to to grow up and, and to really enjoy this neighborhood. Um, coming on the- that We're sitting in the old Central High School here, out this window is the old Central High School. Yes. And uh, one fellow, especially the Ohio State colleagues, with a young fellow named Hopalong Cassidy, uh -huh. who was a football Heisman Trophy winner, went to high school right here, and then on to Ohio State. So. Right. He's yeah. probably better known than city auditors today, but that's where he went to high school. <laughs> well, thank you. Next, we're going to uh, turn it over to Jim Sweeney, who the Franklinton Development uh, Association, as I believe, has been for the last 12 years with your sleeves rolled up, working right in the heart of the neighborhood on all levels of development in that area. So this seems like a natural um, segue to you to tell us now to take from the history that Mr. Dorian has presented us into our present and into our future. Sure, my pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's, a, it's an honor and a pleasure to be part of this, this panel, especially an honor for me to sit next to a Columbus legend, Central Ohio <laughs> legend, and Mr. Dorian. Um, I have the honor and pleasure of also being the director of the Franklinton Development Association. Uh, as Mr. Dorian outlined, Franklinton uh, is an old community, oldest in central Ohio, uh, challenged by all the challenges that other central city communities had. That is to say, divestment, the post-war era, things like that. Um, redlining uh, was another one. But we've also had the added addition of, uh, or the addition of uh, frequent flooding, <laughs> devastating frequent flooding. Um, so this side of the river has seen a lot of, of uh, of challenges in that way, and we've had to recover. During the 80s, FEMA designated uh, Franklinton as an official floodplain, and that required uh, building owners uh, and housing uh, house owners to get flood insurance, which was an extra expense. Um, but it also pro uh, um, prohibited any new construction that didn't elevate above the flood level. And we're talking about significant floods, 17 feet high in some places. So in order to build down here, you needed to put a house on stilts. <laughs> now, a few uh, institutions were able to work with that because they, because they're institutions like the library. We have a wonderful library in Franklin was built during that era. Um, but mostly development could not occur. And that further drove down values in the area that were depressed already because divestment and flooding. But there was this long period of stagnation where nothing could get built. You couldn't even rehab a house beyond 10%, beyond 50% of its original value. And we're talking about a house that is sometimes 100 years old, essentially functionally obsolete by, by its layout because it's old, um, full of asbestos and lead. <laughs> um, 
and uh, the value with the value of something like twenty thousand dollars, you can tell you know that, and you can only put fifty percent of that value into it. Uh, the houses, it just wasn't a workable model, and so the house housing stock declined significantly, and the population declined after the floods. Mo most people left, I think, uh, at its peak. And I checked this with Mr. Dorian. <laughs> at its peak, Franklinton housed about thirty thousand people. Okay, and we are down as of our last check to 8,800. And so that might go a long way to explain a lot of the vacant houses that exist in the neighborhood and the vacant land that exists in the neighborhood. Um, my organization was found in, founded in 93 um, as a way to react to the, 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 the flood issue, the, the, the property value issue, the general housing stock issue. Um, we uh, were aware the flood wall, was, uh, the, the, the Army Corps engineer was getting ready to start the flood wall, and it took about 10 years, Mr. Dorian said, and got done in 2003. So during the, that 10-year that period, we kind of ramped up and, and got our designations with the city and state. Uh, they hired me in 2002 to begin really working on this stuff. And, you know, I compare Franklinton at that period as a, um, a pool party where nobody will jump in. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody wants to swim, but nobody wants to be the first to jump into the pool. Uh, a lot of people had bought a lot of property, assembled it, and, and, and weren't necessarily interested in being the first ones to take a risk. Well, uh, we being the nonprofit, again, um, formed in 93 by um, the hospital, Net Care Alliance, um, uh, Gliden Community House, uh, Franklinton Area Commission. Um, we see it as our role to be the first ones to jump in, to take the risk, and, and, and we're incentivized to do that, and we're empowered to do that through different grant programs available through the city and the county and the state and other places. And so we began, when they brought me aboard, we began building houses. And it's a significant uh, undertaking. Not only do we have uh, a, a, an environment, an economic environment, where, where the houses, where the, where the the houses wouldn't sell for the, for the amount uh, that it would cost to build them, anywhere near the cost to build them. We also had an environment uh, with a very negative uh, uh, reputation. As Mr. Dorian points out, the Bottoms is a very, uh, a very old name and, and it referred to the, the physical uh, uh, geography of the space, but it came to take on another definition as, as incomes declined and as, as property values declined. It became a, 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 another name for basically a socioeconomic bottom. <laughs> So a lot of people react negatively to the name. Uh, a lot of people um, uh, uh, still call it that. And so we, we sort of have this double name. It's, it ends up being kind of interesting when we have this sort of um, 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 secret identity almost. There's two uh, ways you can describe Franklinton. People have fun with that. And, uh, and, and uh, so we began working on, on trying to do real estate development, that is to say houses in the neighborhood. And after a while, it, it, we, we became to realize a way that we might approach this is to begin changing the, 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 the culture of the neighborhood. Not the culture, I'm sorry, but the perception of the neighborhood from outside the neighborhood. Well, as Mr. Dorian points out, there's a lot of pride in the community. There's a lot of misunderstanding outside the community of, the, of Franklinton. And so we began sort of inviting people over. We, we created the Franklinton Arts District, which um, was sort of a, 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 a sort of a catchy, shiny way to get people interested to come over. We thought if people came over for an arts event, they might see that it's not as bad as they thought, and they might return. And that really caught on. We just kept plugging away at it, having different arts events, um, and uh, working with the, the institutions, the other institutions in the neighborhood, I should mention, the Glidden Community House, Lower Lights Ministries, uh, a few initiatives have started over the years, the Franklinton Gardens, uh, Franklinton Cycle Works. Um, and some new ones are, are moving into the neighborhood now. But so we've wrestled with, the, with the, the, the image of the neighborhood, the reputation of the neighborhood. And I think we've kind of got, got the upper hand on that. <laughs> in fact, we're sitting here talking about this right today, I think is an indication that we were able to change the narrative. We were able to push Franklinton to the center of the conversation about revitalization. And especially in, in that we're, we are now poised at a point where we can begin applying the principles that were hard learned throughout the country about how to revitalize neighborhoods without displacing the existing population. I don't know that we have any, any magic answers, but we are certainly have the determination to, to find them and to work on that. Like I said, my organization does affordable housing. So we look at ways that we might be able to partner with the bigger investment community that has begun to take an interest in the neighborhood. Um, we look at ways that we can partner with them to ensure that we're not essentially displacing the historic owners of the community. Now, in the eastern part of Franklinton, let's say everything east of 315, it's, a, it's an area that doesn't really even have any housing left. Not much, some, 
but, but very few houses are left over there. And, and we're chewing everything we can do to keep the houses that are there. But we're also looking at a, a situation with a lot of vacant land. And so there can be a lot of new development there. And, 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 and our role at the Franklinton Development Association, we see, as, uh, is to be a convener of people and, 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 and to express our concerns and, and put forth our vision, which was actually articulated beautifully in a plan that uh, the city of Columbus paid for, which is winning awards everywhere, by the way, um, on how we can revitalize the neighborhood in a very inclusive way. And we're happy to say art will be a big part of that, and so will technology. It was interesting. We started, uh, we started talking about Franklinton as an arts district. And that is to say, part of Franklinton is an arts district. And that quickly turned into an innovation district <laughs> because we, we, we partnered with the Columbus Idea Foundry. We uh, received a grant from the city of Columbus to buy a fantastic building right over here across the, the railroad tracks. And we redeveloped it as the new home of the Columbus Idea Foundry, which is a makerspace. And you'll have to uh, look up what a makerspace is if we don't all know. Um, but it's a hotbed of innovation and education opportunities. It's a very democratic place, a democratic environment where people can go and take advantage of, of of um, the tools that exist, not just older tools, but, but modern tools, 3D printers, CNC routers, things like that, to, to begin to uh, express themselves and, and to uh, form uh, different companies and, and, and generally pursue entrepreneurial ideas. So, and a large part of that is technology. And so we've been, begun really attracting a lot of intelligent people over to the neighborhood who all have, very fortunately, I'm very grateful that everybody we brought into the discussion to this point have been more than enthusiastic about revitalizing Franklinton in a very equitable fashion. Wanting to contribute to building this place, as, as Mr. Dorian says, as a place for everyone. To embrace diversity, to be inclusive, to find ways to, to not only build the eastern part of the neighborhood uh, uh, up in a way that, that, that embraces everyone in the community, but also find, the, find ways for the energy that now exists and is now growing in the eastern part of the neighborhood to find its way to the western part of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Fact is, most people live west of 315. Right. About 99% of the people in Franklinton live on that side of 315. Um, as I said, it's mostly depopulated. And it's also, I mean, we, we cannot, we have to be very careful that we're not declaring victory. <laughs> we're declaring victory over over uh, desperation, if you will. Well, there's hope, but we still have significant social issues to work with. Incomes in Franklinton are less than $17,000 a year compared to uh, uh, median in Columbus at $40,000 a year. As I said, population's down to 8,800 people-ish, um, down from 30,000. Uh, the home ownership rate is only 23%. These are all things that we work on at Development Association all the time, only now we're doing it from a position of hope. Where we used to build a house and for sale using the city programs and have it sit for six months while we developed a property owner that wasn't afraid of the neighborhood and could actually get the mortgage on a $70,000 house. Now we have waiting lists. And, and, and the reason is I think we've changed the narrative. Um, and that is bringing investment with it. Um, you're going to have to wa wrap me up when you think I'm getting up a little bit long because I can go all day. Oh, I, I think you're, you, you can wrap up naturally as you. <laughs> You've got a okay. couple more minutes. Okay. One thing I would just like to interject is this whole notion of the bottoms. You know, I'm an old farm girl. The bottoms was the best farmland that we had. I mean, it was rich, it was fertile, it was where things grew. So I would change the narrative on that whole bottoms thing, too. <laughs> it's known as some of the most fertile land in Ohio, but not farmed anymore. Right. But still, there's a nice little, Early you know. Hearted. Yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, we actually have a, a really successful um, uh, grassroots initiative, so to speak, <laughs> uh, uh, in Franklinton called Franklinton Gardens. And uh, they've been doing great work. It's hard work. Urban gardening is really hard work. And they're out there doing it. They've been around uh, seven, six, seven years now. It's been wonderful. You know, one of, one of the great things about doing this work in this neighborhood is seeing all the different people that have a real passion for making this go. Mm -hmm. um, and they come from all walks of life, young, old, high incomes, low incomes, want to contribute to this because I think everybody sees that this is basically a good thing. It's a smart thing. And I'll point out one other thing, um, and that is neighborhood revitalization in general, especially center city, downtown type neighborhoods, is, 
inherently green. <laughs> you know, when we, I think about urban gardens, I think about, uh, you know, uh, protecting our planet, finding different ways to not drain resources. And I, I think revitalization of a neighborhood like Franklinton it, is green at its core. We're putting into place, if, it, sometimes we get uh, uh, um, uh, 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 a program into place through the state called Low Income Housing Tax Credits, and it generally yields about 40 houses to the neighborhood. It's a, it's a big deal. We get them once every four or five years if we work really hard. Um, but that's 40 houses. That's 40 new houses in a community where the appraisal values are extremely stunted. Um, and those uh, 40 houses is important because that's the size of a small subdivision that normally in the past would have gone into the suburbs, out mm -hmm. to the cornfields, which is a lot easier to do. But consider in the cornfields you're putting in all new infrastructure, I mean roads, gas, water, sewer, police, emergency services, schools, everything's got to be replaced out there. And everybody who lives there generally has to drive back into the center city. So they're, they're on the roads, they're creating pollution, they're using resources. Mm -hmm. I would argue that there's very few things that are more green and healthy for our planet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> not, just our, not, not just our city bottom line over time, but for our planet, the neighborhood revitalization in the way that we're doing it. Great. Well, thank you very much, Jim, for that. So as you can see, there have been a lot of great things happening in Franklinton, but the story doesn't end there, and it, it really shouldn't. What we are now looking towards doing is taking the lessons that we have learned, the lessons that we continue to learn, and finding ways, bringing very smart people into the discussion so that we can figure out a formula and a way for measuring and encouraging this kind of development worldwide. Uh, so at this, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Carolyn Wagner to speak a little bit to uh, your role at the Battelle, Battelle Center and its role in Franklinton. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, I'm Caroline Wagner. Um, I'm the executive director of the Battelle Center uh, for Science and Technology Policy, and we're, we operate within the John Glenn College of Public Affairs. So our focus is on uh, public governance, public uh, welfare, and uh, social goods. So um, really our job at this time, we're partly funded by Battelle, so, um, and Battelle is, is keenly interested in intelligence, intelligent communities, education, um, and the introduction of more technology and science into making life better uh, for people. Um, and so our job has been really to align with um, uh, uh, Mr. Cavan, Gary Cavan, um, Paul Carlson from the city and the mayor's vision also um, to find ways to support that. Um, so that's been uh, what we've been working with them um, to find ways to say, well, what is an intelligent community? How does uh, science and technology help this? And so in a way, there's a couple of nice themes that are emerging from this discussion. One of them is this hearkening back to um, like the 18th century. And so for the 18th century, I'd like to tell a little story about intelligent communities because intelligent communities isn't a 21st century concept. We've had intelligent communities for many centuries. But in the 18th century, they had the um, tradition of going around and having Christmas carols. Um, this is mostly in England, and they would sing Christmas carols to people from outside their homes. And one of those Christmas carols was about figgy pudding. You'll remember, oh, bring us some figgy pudding, right? <laughs> so the idea of figgy pudding was that in the parish, if people couldn't bring out the figgy pudding to the carolers, it meant that they were starving, that they didn't have enough food. Mm -hmm. That was an indicator, okay? It was an indicator of a need in that community for food. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was a way to gain intelligence about a need, a social need in a community. Now, one of the things we've seen over time is as we get so-called smarter, we've become more isolated in some ways. And yet, the technology actually has ways to make us more intelligent in the old sense of figgy pudding. So one of the things that Battelle was interested in is why is it that um, high school kids aren't going to school? What makes kids truant, and how do we find them in the current moment and get them to school, right? What's the problem? Okay. Well, one of the problems they found out is that in some cases, some of these kids couldn't go to school because grandma was sick, 
with diabetes. She couldn't get her medicine. And the child, because the child didn't work, stayed home to help take care of grandma. Okay, so this is a figgy pudding moment. This is a moment that we could actually use technology to find out what is the problem and how do we solve this at a really radically local level, mm -hmm. right? Because ultimately an intelligent community is a radically local solution to a problem. So it doesn't mean that as we come into the 21st century, we're gonna get so smart that everyone's just on phones all the time, um, which actually I have a teenager, so I know they do spend a lot of time on the phone. Um, but that we find ways to use that technology to make us more human, to make us more intelligent in a figgy pudding sense of um, how do we really use the technology to solve local problems, get medicine to people, get food to people who, um, who need, you know, elderly who are home and not able to get out people who need problems solved that are, are solvable. So for example, at The Ohio State University, we have a number of programs uh, in the engineering department called humanitarian engineering. Now the humanitarian engineering folks, they go to Tanzania and Guatemala and Honduras you know, to help solve problems. We have problems right here in Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio, maybe even in Franklinton, that can be solved with the engineering and science that is being done at Ohio State. And yet we don't think about ways to connect those. Intelligence and intelligent communities can help us make those connections better. So that if there are some specific problems with sewer, sewer, problems, sewer lines, water, electric, putting solar in so that a whole block becomes off the grid, comes off the grid, and is able to have their own energy, their own uh, solar energy and then is able to link into gardens. So let's say a garden, one of these urban gardens, which are really a tremendous um, development for um, a lot of urban spaces, have too much cabbage. How are they going to let people know or figure out mm -hmm. who needs the cabbage, right? So you can use these phones. They're awesome for that kind of thing, right? You go, oh, ca cabbage at the corner of, of, you know, Gift and 4th Street, come on by and pick it up. And then you can get an, you know, an immediate response, you can run over and, and pick it up. So it seems to me that if we think about a vision, and this aligns so much with the mayor's vision for the neighborhood um, pride community activities um, that have gone on, and we've met with the neighborhood pride people um, within the city to find out about how to link smartness and intelligence to the kind of neighborhood pride activities that can help make people um, and people's lives just easier to live. Um, that's what the technology offers to us. And so we see that the role of um, the Battelle Center, um, since we are academics, <laughs> we study things, so that's our job really to study and measure things. But what we want to measure is the extent to which we are able to be radically local with our intelligence um, and make um, connections between, there's now knowledge in theory up in the cloud um, that is available to us that was never available before. So we have an ability to draw that knowledge down and make it locally useful, make it stick locally in a way that we couldn't before. But if we're going to do this linking and syncing kind of combination of activities, we have to have an intermediary and that's part of what intelligent tools help us to do. So one of the visions that we have at Ohio State in the Battelle Center is um, to work through Battelle. Now Battelle has a whole bunch of people that spend a lot of time going around to states and cities, helping them to solve problems, develop economic um, growth, and you know, build in technology solutions. So the question then we have, uh, in addition to the Battelle uh, experience of doing that, they also have the educational group that is trying to reach out and make sure everyone gets educated. So one of the things that we're trying to actually move towards is, is a vision that was um, expressed to us actually by Reese Nieder, who is the founder of Forge Columbus in Franklinton. And by the way, I have in my bedroom a beautiful painting I bought at the, um, the Franklinton <laughs> Art Center, um, which I just love. But also um, uh, Forge Columbus has um, this vision of what, what we're kind of, uh, we kind of shortened to E3, which is um, equity, environment, and economic growth. So it's not just a matter of growing economics, right? Because it's also a matter of equity. And these equity questions and issues are not gonna be solved by um, you know, uh, Janet Yellen over in Washington, D.C. They're gonna be solved locally. 
Um, and so the equity questions, the environment questions, the sustainability um, that Franklinton Neighborhood um, Association is working towards, the tolerance that Mr. Dorian referred to that is a beautiful part of Columbus. These are things that we can build upon and help grow and nurture um, in a way that um, is not technological in the sense that, you know, we're going to bring in semiconductor plants or we're going to build computers here, but that we use intelligence um, and, a, and a vision of an intelligent community um, that can support the, the, um, the really strong uh, features uh, within Columbus. So we want to take this broader sense of intelligent community um, and link it to what's happening at Ohio State in humanitarian engineering, linking it to the science um, students, and linking it to the young people. The millennials that I work with and teach are an incredible group of young people. They have a vision of a tolerant, sustainable, um, local, locally connected world that's absolutely fantastic. They're, I have so much hope for the future because they are concerned about doing good in a way that I just didn't see in my own generation. <laughs> we were all kind of out for ourselves, I hate to say it. But um, this generation, the millennials, they're not worried about, you know, am I going to get a great job? They're worried about, am I going to make this world a better place? So I want to get those kids moving into the community, meeting uh, you know, people like Mr. Dorian, having you tell the story, and hopefully we can get you over there, to these students that, that are flocking to majors like humanitarian engineering. I mean, they're flocking to these degrees. That's not a degree that's going to get them quote unquote job, but that's what they want to do. They want to commit themselves to making this world a better place. And that is going to happen locally. So that's kind of our big vision. Um, and I'm, Turning to the really smart person here in the room, <laughs> Dr. Bedford, she's the one who has the real, um, the overall, arch the overarching view of how we can measure. And because obviously, if you can't measure it, you can't say how well you're doing. So one of the things we're trying to do is figure out how do we measure these things, um, and how do we make the um, the measurements reflect this f emphasis on tolerance. Um, sustainability and um, kind of local intelligence, the figgy pudding kind of concept. <laughs> so. And she's already beeping. Out. She's tweeting out to the rest no, of the no, world. No, no, no. <laughs> Incom in incoming calls. Well, um, thank you so much for allowing me um, to participate today. But I also want to say thank you to the whole city of Columbus for allowing me to be part of this incredible effort here. You know, it's, it's one thing to be a researcher in an academic office. Um, it's rare to have the opportunity to take your ideas to a real space and, and be able to test them to perhaps more importantly to be able to learn from the real world and take that back mm -hmm. into the, um, um, so, well, I struggle with technology here just a moment, <laughs> please. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about my background before I came to Kent State, okay? So I was at the World Bank for 15 years, okay? And one of the things that we did at the World Bank that we were very proud of was the Knowledge Economy Index. And we would go all over the world applying the Knowledge Economy Indexes index to countries. We had a very well-developed methodology. So I was extremely, like, I didn't realize how arrogant I was. <laughs> but when I, when I came to, do. yes, yeah, exactly. Um, it's a learning experience for me. So when I came to Kent State as the Goodyear professor, I thought, well, I'm just going to show that we can take that methodology and apply it to the state level. Well, it didn't work, okay, because I realized in a very painful experience when I was trying to write a paper that had already been accepted, and I had to totally rewrite it. We had all the wrong indicators. We had all the wrong focus. There wasn't really anything in the knowledge economy index that focused on knowledge or intelligence, right? So I had to step back and think, what do we really mean by the knowledge economy? And what's different about the knowledge economy from the industrial economy and the agricultural economy. I think when Mr. Dorian took us through that 
is that um, story, uh, basically the agricultural to the industrial, to now the knowledge economy in Columbus. And when you think about the knowledge economy, it really changes our focus, okay? And I think this ties into what Mr. Sweeney was saying. The knowledge economy focuses on a different kind of factor of production. So I apologize for the economics background here okay, and the jargon. Okay. While financial capital and physical capital are still important, the most important factor of production in the knowledge economy is people and intellectual capital. So one of the mistakes I think we made in the 50s and 60s and probably why so many people are looking to the Franklin development plans now as a good practice is because you're, you're thinking about revitalizing the built environment, you know, the looking maybe from big industry, I think you said, to more micro manufacturing and micro industry. But what I really hear and see in your plans is revitalization of people and revitalization of, you know, building the intellectual capital. The, as Caroline said, the technology infrastructure is so important, right? But not just for the technology infrastructure in itself. At breakfast this morning, everything I heard was, we do broadband, we're doing fiber because it enables the firefighters, mm -hmm. because it enables the teachers. And everything I'm hearing is an investment back in the people, right? And that's what is really going to make Columbus, the intelligent city, because the source of intelligence, right, people, is going to grow as a result of this. So as Caroline is mentioning, you know, there are many, in, and in the knowledge index that I created after I realized the World Bank's economy, knowledge economy index didn't really work. This isn't being broadcast to Washington. Is it? <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right. But they, they, the World Bank now agrees that that index does not work. China is saying, we're not really interested in that macro level of measurement. We're not even really interested in the state level of measurement. We're interested in the neighborhood level of investment. And that's another thing that's so valuable in Columbus because you have this focus on the neighborhood. And what I came to, the conclusion I came to in redefining a knowledge index for cities is that it's all based on transactions, knowledge transactions among people. Okay? Maybe a little bit of what our cities looked like in the 1920s before we did the urban renewal, et cetera. Right? That in many cases, I think we destroyed communities to revitalize the built environment, right? You're taking a very different and a much smarter approach now. You're focusing on people and the environment and the social and the civic. So when we talk about a knowledge index, we're looking at all of the different things that create kinds of intelligence. Social intelligence, civic intelligence, cultural intelligence, all of those things. It's not just investing in business that creates intellectual capital. In fact, I think you know, the work that you're doing with the young people is just critical mm -hmm. because how you're going to engage those people from West Franklinton is if you know, the millennials, as you say, they're collaborative. They don't even think about you know, things that we used to think about, mm -hmm. right? It's just natural to them. They're going to engage. You get those, you create opportunities for those people to come together and collaborate. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is where you're going to see the innovation. So, thank you. Great. Thank you. That was a wonderful overview. Thanks to everyone. Shall we give them a little round of applause? <laughs> So that leaves us with about 10 minutes, Lou, for you to uh, ask any questions of any of these subject matter minutes. experts. Are you sure. <laughs> You're, so after all that, I, you know, I could. have been telecommunicating with them. <laughs> <laughs> you could spend 10 hours with them. Thank you. Um, as, as you were all talking, I was thinking we're going to be in Toronto this year for our uh, summit in June, and uh, Columbus will be one of the seven cities that will be sort of the stars of the show. Our vision was to start out with about 400 communities every year, have a dialogue about 
how they are re-energizing themselves, um, how they're being radically local, as you said, Carolyn, and, uh, and, and to bring them there and to have this dialogue, really, uh, among the world's cities for the simple reason that uh, cities are really where the action is. You know, we started, we went up there 20 years ago in, in Toronto, that's why we're going back. It's the 20th anniversary of the Intelligent Community Movement, which evidently we're, create, we're you know, media says we started, which we probably did because we lost our shirt <laughs> on the first conference. And it was the first time we'd ever brought uh, telecom people together with economic development and, and mayors and that, those types of people, and they had no, no idea why they were in the room. They had no idea what we were going to do with this one broadband connection we had to bring a band from Vancouver and show them live. You know, we were, we were kind of doing all that stuff. But what's happened over 20 years is that a lot of dynamics that uh, you described very well, Denise, have taken place in the world. One of them is the problems have become so complex at the national levels that the national governments through you know, not being bad people or, or you know, not wanting to solve the problems, just can't solve them. Uh, I saw Henry Kissinger in 2011 in New York say that the nation state as it was designed is no longer functioning. And that's Henry Kissinger. I mean, if, if, when he says that, you know you got a problem. So what, what's happened is human beings are doing exactly what human beings are supposed to do. They fall back on their own. They fall back on their, their tribes and they start to solve their problems in the place they will defend at all costs irrespective of the enemy and that's home. And that's what we've seen over the last 20 years in our movement and as, as I said as I was sitting here listening to you guys I was thinking I can probably go home now because uh, this dialogue has flourished. I mean it, you're, you're using words that you know we, st we actually own intelligent community. You're using those words now in ways that that we envision them being used, so you know it's 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 really fantastic to see it happening. I'm not going to quit yet doing this though, because I think there's a, there's a lot more to learn from you guys. Um, the one distinction we're trying to make, and this is one of my questions, because I can only ask a few, is what we we've seen um, the movement now, in our view, from smart to intelligent. And people are using smart in ways that I don't think they fully understand. But what it's come down to is that people are introducing technology as the solution to everything. Mm -hmm. right? all, all mankind's problems and the human engineering piece of it kind of gets missed because it too is now the complex problem that needs to be solved. Mm -hmm. we've, we've got the technology figured out. You know, if I sit down with Gary for 10 minutes and he tells me what he's doing or Bill this morning or Jim, uh, we can do the technology. I come out of the satellite business. That's where I started my company. Uh, we can take three geosynchronous satellites and cover the whole earth with a broadband footprint. The question then becomes, as I heard in Korea one time, because we don't talk about broadband there anymore, oh fine, we know, how the we know that the lights are in the room. Now, what do we do when the lights are on? That's the big question now with, with human intelligence. And I think it's, it's, it's sort of the next layer where we're, we're going to be doing I think what you're talking about in Franklinton, uh, using art to do cultural mining because it's an endless natural research, and doing that, as you said, Hugh, to unify communities. So my, so my, my question is, as you think about, because you all touched on it, moving from, as Columbus moves from smart, used to the word technology, to an intelligent community, what, is that, what does that transition look like in your view? I think the, the I wanted to say, I, I think we're in the, especially in Franklinton, but probably throughout communities, we're in the beginning stage of the Renaissance. Yeah. And in all respect to the uh, um, increasing te technology and the more data that is thrust upon us and so forth, the uh, most important thing to me in a community is dialogue. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to need help as to how to interpret data, how to apply data, mm -hmm. but it's so important that we continue that dialogue. I use the terminology openness and so forth, mm -hmm. but as human beings, we've got to interact with each other. Mm -hmm. And and I know I myself in my office, I get flooded with data sometimes, yeah. <laughs> and have to call upon people with, what does this mean and what does that mean? But I need those people. To help me, right? 
and, and, and I'll, I'll repeat that word dialogue. To me, it's, it's, it's uh, indispensable in yeah. the community. I don't know, Jim, if you have some other thoughts. And I was interested that, that um, you're, you study, you got a PhD in partnerships. That, that, that's, a, that's a lot about dialogue, isn't it? Absolutely. And that's, yeah, exactly. I, I just, before Jim, I, you know, uh, in Tai Chung, which was our intelligent community in 2013, um, the mayor there has set up a, an alliance among its 23 universities. They have 23 universities and it's in its industrial sector to try to do the types of things that you guys probably could, could teach them about. And I asked them, how do, how do, you, how do you make that work? Because you've got Taiwan Semiconductor and you've got, you know, 23 universities. And he looked at me and he said, lots and lots of meetings. Mm -hmm. you know? But that's dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would say, I'm sorry, I would say that over the course of our involvement with the Intelligent Community Forum, that has generated a lot of dialogue between great people that were doing great things in their little section of the city. And I do believe that this has really brought together a lot of people to, to generate dialogue. So that's a, a great offshoot of your organization and glad, this effort. Yeah. Glad to hear that. I well, anecdotally mention one thing. Uh, Lou, about the differences in some of our cultures. Um, I, I, I love to entertain international visitors in the city. So I had a couple of Russian gentlemen over a few years ago, and I was explaining to them how the public, the citizens of Columbus, can come to their open legislative sessions and come up and speak at the microphone and so forth and explain and uh, express their frustrations. The gentleman got a very, very frown on his face and I don't speak Russian that well, so I said to the interpreter with me, I said, did I say something wrong? What, uh, why is he frowning? So she spoke to him and she turned back to me and she said, he said, you mean you let them speak? <laughs> <laughs> right. so I always remember that. <laughs> well, you can see the results in the economy. I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. I have a slide actually of the Korean Peninsula at night. I think, I've, Paul, you might have seen it. You know, it, it, right? If you if you look at South Korea at night, it's lit. It's it, you know, it's bright and it's thriving. You know, this is a this is an open society, a democratic society, using its culture, harnessing itself, understands who it is, moving forward. What is it? 19 miles north of Seoul, you've got complete darkness, and that and I think that's what's at stake with cities now too. I mean, that's what. Jim, I'm sorry, you know, I, I want you to answer the question, but I think what's what's going on with cities now is that they have a an opportunity to go from light to dark, and and I think the the contrast is that great, isn't it? With a with a place like a Franklinton, it, it could have continued to plunge. It is, it is that great, and 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 I feel like we've seen it. You know, a business partner of ours says, "Oh, guess what? After 12 years of working, we're an overnight success." <laughs> and 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 <laughs> but but it is about dialogue, and it is about the 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 expansion. Not all about, but it is definitely assisted by the expansion of the communication system. Nice. Our partner at Idea Foundry, Alex Bandar, did a TEDx speech, which is just another example of uh, great communication, uh, where he talked about um, communication through the ages. You know, it was one-on-one, -on -one, you know, then, the, then the radio was invented, then it was one-on-many, then, well, the telephone, and then, you know, you can, people not in front of each other can speak. With radio, one person can speak to several people. And there are many more iterations. I'll have you look at his <laughs> TEDx speech to get it exactly right. But now it's everybody's talking to everybody. There's a website in Columbus, uh, a blog, I guess, or a, I don't know what you'd call it, a community forum, if you will, called Columbus Underground. And that really got off the ground right around the time we started doing our work in Franklinton. And we were active on that. And there was a lot of people that would get involved in the conversation. And it is about communication. Technology can enhance communication. People can solve problems when they're communicating with each other. I look at um, the approaches, the, 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 the popularity of the approaches that we're, we're using now in revitalization. With the, thing, the popularity of our mayor making smart investments with Mr. Dorian's help to, to, to invest in things that we wouldn't have two generations ago. No way. We would have looked at, that, at redeveloping our cities according to principles that, that, that weren't working. That seemed like a good idea. Again, with post, in post-war, America can build its way out of anything. But now we know from discussion that these principles are faulty. They're not smart. They're not intelligent. The intelligent thing is to talk to each other and, and, and adopt these principles and, and figure out what really works and then invest in that. And that's what we're seeing happen in Franklinton. And it's all being powered and employed by these smart people that are weighing in in this smart way. 
and, 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 and building a, a groundswell. And it's dragging other people into the conversation also. It's really been fantastic. I, it, it's been so interesting. We, our, 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 our momentum towards revitalization has grown exponentially in the last two years, two to three years, due to a, a great communication system. And led by the city, we've done a couple different plans for the different parts of the neighborhood. And those, those uh, we saw people turn out like crazy because we were, out, we were uh, advertising these online, we were having online uh, forums, all kinds of things happened. So we've managed to harness the communication part of the technology to get everybody on the same page, and people agree when you present them with the facts that a, a revitalization is a smart play from any direction you look at it. There's a lot of ways, can I just add that sure. there's a lot of ways in which people are smart, right? Mm -hmm. So we've tended to measure people by their ACT and SAT, but people are really smart in a lot of ways. One of the things I like to watch with teenagers and their phones is that allows them to be smart and cute in a rather small community. So um, some, my daughter is very good with photography. She's an excellent photographer. And she'll put up a, po a picture, and she'll get all kinds of likes. And then another kid who's good at singing will sing on, you know, to the phone, and, and then it goes around. And so in a way, we're kind of returning to a time, almost an 18th century time, when you would go down the street to hear someone play the piano and sing, rather than go to a giant concert, you know, or something like that, where we appreciate the smartness and talents of people right around us. And that, this generation coming up, right, is that kind of generation. I mean, my I can only be that like, we can be like Moses and Sarah looking over the over the rock into the next and, promised land. And, um, and, and none of us would have ever dared to sing no. unless we had singing lessons and, singing and lessons. Lessons. achieved a yeah. certain level. And so right. I, I do yeah. believe that the technology is human it has a humanizing potential. Um, and to some extent, I think some adults, like people in my generation, are a little scared of, of it. But I see it as a tremendous potential to humanize us. That's a, um, that's, a, that, that's a really interesting point because, you know, Hugh, you were talking about the division, you know, the 315 thing and like that. And we did a lot of Moses did a lot of that in New York. But um, I, I don't know if it's um, humanizing anything. I mean, human beings are human beings. For, for, for whatever reason, I mean, this was our observation when we started ICF, in the post-industrial phase, we had put a linear layer over everything we did, probably because of the economy. You can make a, in order to make a car in Ohio, you made it the same way you made it in Japan, the same way you made it in Germany, same way you made it in Detroit. And that, that tend to do something to us in terms of how we responded. And it, it seemed to cut off our, our spontaneity, which is at the source of our creativity. So. Um, that's the measurement. Well, yeah, that's right. And I just, you know, I, I just want to make an observation because it's, it's wonderful be, between uh, uh, what, he, what they're doing in Franklinton and, and what David was talking about with Cozy After Dark, which is you've, you've got these new structures in place, but you're just allowing spontaneity. You're allowing occurrences of spontaneity. And for us, that's the sort of holy grail because that's, I, we did a lot of study before we started. That's how the Renaissance started. You were mashing people up, but they were in Campos in Italy 500 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Is that is that is the knowledge index get us there? Absolutely, and I think um, another aspect of moving from an industrial economy to a knowledge economy is this um, willingness to take a little bit of a risk. Which you know, it, in order to survive World War II, we had to adopt certain mental models and the the manufacturing model, the industrial model. Mm -hmm which I think you know, emphasized a certain kind of intelligence, mm -hmm. an intellectual, you know, the, the high IQ. Things, yeah. yeah, but, but it, it sort of uh, lowered the value of all the other kinds of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And now I think we're bringing that back. So it's a little bit more holistic. I don't know if I'm, if I'm well, answering your question, no, but I'm yeah. And, yeah. I was asking. Unfortunately, yeah. I'm going to have to let that oh. be the last oh, question. Sorry. The last word. Fascinating. You'll get a chance, I think, to catch up with both of these ladies this evening and at other times. But I know that we have a very tight itinerary for your site visit. So we need to thank everyone and wrap up. This has been a wonderful conversation. Thanks, thank you, Lou. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. <laughs>